I'm at the Early Television Museum in Hillard, Ohio. And we'll go inside and see what's going on. So I'm inside the Early Television Museum and let's take a look at the early mechanicals. So here's the sets that are on display in this room and they have a audio narration that talks us through five of the sets. Pretty interesting collection of uh, mechanical spitting wheel televisions. The earliest television sets used mechanical means to create a picture. Find the small green sign with one on it. The first patent for television was granted in 1884. It described a system using rotating discs with holes drilled in them. One disc was in the camera in front of a photoelectric cell. An identical disc was used in the receiver in front of a neon tube. The picture was viewed through a magnifying lens in front of the disc. At that time, many of the components needed to make the system work didn't exist, such as vacuum tubes. Many years later, in 1926, a Scottish inventor named John Logie Baird produced the first television fixtures in his laboratory in London. Three years later, he was broadcasting to viewers. The pictures were extremely crude. Today's television pictures are made up of over a thousand lines, allowing for very clear pictures. Baird's transmissions were with 30 lines. By 1930, there were about 30 stations in the U.S. and stations in most major European cities. Because they used the same channels as AM radio, signals could be received over long distances. This is the TV set that Baird's company sold starting in 1929. About 1,000 were made. The cabinet is metal and the viewer watched through the lens on the front. You could buy a TV set or you could build your own since they were simple devices. A few years ago, we interviewed Murray Mercier, his picture is on the wall, who told us that as a teenager, he helped his father make the first TV set in Columbus. The small set on the table was their first set. In 1928, they watched some of the first U.S. broadcasts from Schenectady, New York, and Washington, D.C. The next year, they built the larger set on the table. Murray's father rented a store on North High Street and put the set in the front window. Murray's job was to sit in the window of the store in the evening and keep the set adjusted so people walking up and down High Street could see television. So here is a Western Union Telegraph dated November 28, 1928 from GE or General Electric Radio Station WGY in Schenectady, New York. It says, received human face turning side to side and moving lips. Also two other objects by our television receiving set. This is the Western Visionette, an example of an American set that was sold to the public. About 500 of these were made. This is the Western Empire State Receiver. About 1932, a new technology emerged which allowed the picture to be projected on a screen, allowing more than one person to watch it. However, the picture was very dim and still only had 45 lines in it. Because of the poor picture quality with mechanical television, it was impossible to do real television programming. Because of this, and since the Great Depression limited the number of people who could afford television sets, mechanical TV broadcasting came to an end in 1932. Some of the tubes used in the early rotating disc televisions. There are two main components in an electronic television system. The camera tube, which converts an image to an electrical signal, and the picture tube, which converts that signal into a visible picture. By 1930, engineers had developed picture tubes that were suitable for television. On the shelf is a small one from the late 20s. However, a working camera tube still hadn't been developed. Two inventors were responsible for solving the problem. Philo Farnsworth grew up in rural Idaho and had no formal scientific education. He came up with an idea for a camera tube, got some investors, and moved to San Francisco. In 1927, he produced a crude picture from his camera. The problem was that it required too much light, and he never overcame that limitation. The other inventor was Vladimir Zworkin. Zworkin worked for Westinghouse in the 1920s, where he also made a camera tube and demonstrated it in the late 20s. 
1930, he went to work for RCA, the largest radio manufacturer at the time. RCA was run by David Sarnoff, a visionary who realized that television would be the next big thing and who spent about $50 million during the Great Depression to develop TV. Zorkin's camera tube, the iconoscope, worked with a relatively low amount of light and allowed a practical television system to be developed. By 1935, RCA had a working system, but Sarnoff decided not to start selling TV sets because the technology was expensive and unreliable and because the Great Depression was still going on. The British, however, had a government-run broadcasting entity, the BBC, and decided to launch the first electronic TV in the fall of 1936, primarily using RCA's technology. The sets in this room, and in the small room next to it, were made from 1936 to 1939. This is the earliest British electronic set we have in our collection. It was made in 1936. Since there was only a single TV station in the country, the sets didn't have a channel selector knob. A modest set cost as much as a new car, so only about 19,000 were made during those three years. About 300 of these sets survive. Larger screen sets had mirrors to watch the picture. This was because the picture tubes were about two and a half feet long, and mounting them vertically made it possible to make a more attractive cabinet. Since television broadcasting was limited to a couple of hours a day, many of the sets had shortwave radios built in. When England declared war on Germany in 1939, television manufacturing and broadcasting ended in England. In 1939, RCA decided that it was time to make television available to the American public. RCA had a large pavilion at the 1939 World's Fair featuring television. There was an area at the fair where people could stand in front of a TV camera and their friends could see them on television. This camera may have been one of those used at the fair. When the fair began, NBC, which was owned by RCA, began regularly scheduled TV programming. RCA introduced their television product line at the fair. The cheapest, which is on the left, required a separate radio for the sound. The most elaborate one on the right included a radio and had a 12-inch picture. Many other companies also started selling sets in 1939. Andrea made a 5-inch set with a magnifying lens to make the picture appear larger. Next to it is a kit set, which took dozens of hours to assemble. You could save a few dollars by doing it yourself. General Electric made five different models of TV sets in 1939 and 1940. About 7,000 sets were made in the United States during 1939 and 1940, and about 350 survive today. As with the British pre-war sets, a mid-range set cost as much as a new car. When the United States entered World War II in 1941, production of TV sets stopped though many stations continued to broadcast with experimental programming throughout the war. During the war, RCA engineers worked on military projects, including a television-guided bomb. This camera was put inside a wooden glider that was taken up underneath a B-17 bomber. It was released when it was close to a target, and television was used to guide the bomb. During the war, engineers learned a lot about technology, especially from radar and aircraft communication that could be applied to television. As a result, the sets made right after the war were much simpler, more reliable, and cheaper. A typical 10 or 12 inch set cost about $400 compared to about $1,600 for a car. These sets are from right after the war. As you can see, manufacturers were experimenting with all sorts of cabinet designs to find out what would sell. There were dozens of companies making sets. In 1948, the seven-inch set was introduced, some with built-in magnifiers. This might seem like a step backward, but it allowed sets to be sold for under $200. Because the cost of a television set kept dropping, television grew very rapidly. At the end of 1947, there were only 200,000 sets in the United States. 
By the end of 1953, six years later, there were 18 million, and half the homes in the country had TV. This is a national TV 7M. It says national was another manufacturer of amateur radio equipment. In the late 40s, they decided to enter the TV business. This set is built in a cabinet like the ones they use for their ham radio receivers. It has a meter to measure signal strength. 1949, seven inch. The Emerson Videograph video jukebox was made in 1947, before most people had seen television. Put a quarter in, and you could either listen to five songs from his jukebox or watch TV for 30 minutes. This is the Dumont Custom. It was made to mount in a wall in your living room. There had to be a closet behind it for servicing, since something went wrong with the early sets frequently. A set like this was expensive, almost $2,000. Now, go past the first row of curtains and look to your right. At the end of the room, find the small green sign with five on it. These sets were sold to bars and clubs in the late 40s, when only a few people had TV in their homes. However, many people went to bars and clubs to watch television. The 1948 World Series was televised, and millions of people saw it at those locations. The Dumont Royal Sovereign was the largest black and white set ever made, with a 30-inch screen. It was made in 1951 and cost almost $2,000. In the late 50s, manufacturers started using plastic and metal for cabinets. The gold and red RCA Portable and Aqua Sylvania Duolette are examples. The Philco Predicta has a space-age look. This version has two parts the screen that goes in front of the room, and the control unit which goes next to your couch or chair. The heavy cable connects them. A wheel containing segments of each of the three primary colors was placed in front of the camera and another one in front of the receiver. One after another, red, blue, and green images were transmitted. It happened so fast that your eye integrated the picture into a full color image. The same method, called the field sequential system, was used by CBS before World War II in an electronic version. After the war, CBS pressured the government to adopt a color system before black and white set sales took off. The main problem with the CBS system was that it wasn't compatible with black and white broadcasting. Two channels would be required in each city for each station, one for color and one for black and white. RCA was working on a compatible system, but progress was slow. Finally, in 1950, the FCC, which regulates TV standards, agreed to hold a competition between the RCA compatible system and the CBS field sequential system to see which would be the standard for the United States. At the time, the RCA system was in the early stages of development and produced poor pictures. The CBS system produced excellent pictures, and the FCC adopted the CBS system. A few programs were broadcast in a few cities, including Columbus, in 1951. This is a studio monitor for the CBS system. To the left of it is a converter, which was placed in front of a black and white set to produce a color picture. RCA was making great progress on its compatible system, and by 1951 it was clear that they would be successful so CBS abandoned its system in late 1951. Now while Larry's tried to fire up this, uh, this spinning disc color monitor and we can't quite get it to lock up, we're fiddling with various controls trying to get it to sync. The RCA system was finally adopted by the FCC as the color standard at the end of 1953. Here are the first color sets sold to the public in the spring of 1954. The Westinghouse and RCA sets had only 12-inch screens and cost over $1,000. At that time, you could get a very nice 21-inch black and white set for $250. As a result, only about 5,000 were sold. During 1955, sets with 21-inch screens were introduced. Over the next 10 years, the sets got somewhat cheaper, but few were sold because of the cost, unreliability, and lack of many color programs. In the mid-60s, RCA teamed up with Walt Disney to produce a show called The Wonderful World of Color. Its purpose was to sell color TV sets, and it worked. 
1970 was the first year in which more color sets were sold than black and white. And we have some more color sets, British and European, in this room. Spartan, a CBS RX90, a CBS RX89. And this is a field sequential color camera. You can see the spinning disc. My hunch is that the lens would focus the light through there as the disc spun. Driven by a pretty hefty motor. But the problem with the field sequential color camera is when the action panned, the picture would break up into red, green, and blue uh, trailing. And so they use field sequential color cameras for the moon missions. And if you go back and look and you see the astronaut kind of jumping around on the moon, you would see the red, blue, and green fringing. This is an interesting looking set. It's a Cuba Comet. And it was made in Germany. It was built in 1962. It's like seven feet long. It has a 21 inch tube in it. As well as looks like a probably an AM FM receiver and a turntable. Another view around the room here. Oh, let's take a look inside this monster. It took a lot of stuff in these big old sets. I'd say the chassis uh, by the CRT there is probably the signal and deflection maybe and power supply in the bottom and that was a lot of tube for a small picture and this was a 1952 CPA RCA prototype you can see that uh, this was definitely a lab model with lots of room inside so the engineers could get in it and poke around make modifications and and many of the uh, picture tubes are on display in here here's a good display of all sorts of camera tubes imaging tubes some of these I have even used. So I have one of these. It's an 1850 iconoscope tube. Um, it was used before the World War II. I actually got one of these when I was uh, working on some equipment at a TV station in Texas. One of the uh, engineers had several at home and he ran home and picked one up and I took it home on the airplane. It survived. And this is a four and a half inch image orthicon that's used in the TK60 camera uh, that I used at Rochester Institute of Technology. And this is a three inch image orthicon and this was used in the GE camera that I was uh, using when I was going to college doing remotes. This is a W76 DOS 140, the world's shallowest color TV tube. It's a 140 degree deflection angle. You know, it really took a lot to bend that beam. Well, this was built by, uh, by Thompson and then purchased by RCA um, but they could never get it to work and never went into production. This room contains our collection of early television cameras and other broadcast equipment. In the middle of the floor are early cameras. The RCA TK31 was the first camera sold after World War II. It was used in TV stations all around the country through the 50s. Also on display are early color cameras from the 60s and 70s. The large camera behind the van is the RCA TK41, the first color camera made in 1954. We are in the process of restoring it. Next to the ramp is an RCA TK1 monoscope camera. In the 40s and 50s, the monoscope produced a test pattern that was used after programming ended early in the morning to adjust the equipment in TV stations. The row of large cabinets is an early television transmitter. This one was owned by Channel 6 here in Columbus and was located at the top of the Levesque Tower beginning in 1949. The large truck is a 1948 RCA mobile production van. This type of van was sold to TV stations around the country. This one was originally in Salt Lake City, Utah. It contains most of the original equipment from 1948, including three cameras. In 1960, it was sold to an educational station in Newark, Ohio, where it was used until 1970. It was then donated to the Ohio Historical Society, which has loaned it to us. In order to get a picture back to the station, a microwave dish was put on top of the truck. A similar dish was mounted on the TV station transmitting tower. These two dishes had to be aligned in order for them to work. Someone had to climb the tower in all kinds of weather to aim the dish. Originally, 
the truck didn't have air conditioning. Imagine being an engineer in the summer in Utah. The windows had to be closed since they needed darkness to view the monitors and the equipment generated a lot of heat. This ends our audio tour of the museum. Feel free to take your time and look around. Thanks for visiting the Early Television Museum. We hope to see you back soon. This is the camera that got me into television. I used a remote truck with three of these on it back in the uh, early 70s, mainly doing bowling shows. So this uses the uh, three inch image orthicon tube. And zoom lenses were pretty rare in those days. So a turret with fixed focal length lenses were used. This RCA TK60, we had three of these at RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, uses the big four and a half inch orth. This was probably um, the last of the black and white studio cameras built. And it still has a turret, but it also has a zoom lens. A Taylor Hobson, probably a 10 to one. And another shot of the lenses. The zoom lens worked with cables that went back to handles that were mounted on the arms for the camera. So this is the zoom crank. And on the other side is the focus. And this is where the cameraman worked. He had a viewfinder and he had some controls, a big crank to uh, rotate the turret. But I don't think he'd rotate it with that zoom on there. So I'm getting a little behind the scenes look here. So this is the lab where they can rebuild picture tubes. This is a lathe. I imagine they spin that around in order to seal the neck of the tube. You know, similar things were made in Grass Valley by Lytton. Uh, they were world famous for their glass blowing lathes. And this one's a woodland. Okay, so all this came from Hawkeye Picture Tube Plant in Iowa. And this is probably one of the less than a handful of facilities left that can rebuild a tube. So I'm in the, uh, the back shop here where a lot of stuff is stored that's, that's been donated and work in progress. So that's the other side of the museum wall. And if you're going to work on old TVs, you're going to need lots of these. Good old vacuum tubes. Also, if you're working on TVs, Sam's Photofax for years had all the manuals and alignment and troubleshooting. So and up here, all the big black notebooks are the writer series. And from my broadcast days, I recognize a lot of these. Uh, the camera manuals and such for RCA and Sony and Ampex and such. Well, that wraps up my tour of the early television museum. I hope you enjoyed that. Please visit their website and their YouTube channel for more interesting material. And I'm going to leave you now with many of the still photos that I took.